Okay, good afternoon. My name is Detlof von Winterfeld. I'm a professor of systems engineering and public policy at the University of Southern California. And I'm here to interview Professor Ralph Keeney uh, for the uh, History and Tradition series of INFORMS. Uh, we are at the annual INFORMS meeting in Phoenix. Uh, it is November 4th, 2018, and this is the History and Tradition series. Uh, Ralph, as many of you know, is a prominent decision analyst, and with Howard Rafer, he is the inventor and developer of multi-attribute utility theory, which is one of the cornerstones of decision analysis today. Welcome, Ralph. Thank you. I hope you're well. If you don't mind, let's move chronologically through your life and highlighting some of the more interesting points, both academically and personally. And let's begin at the beginning. You grew up in Montana in a, what I think is a very small town called Lewiston, Lewistown. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I, I did grow up in Lewistown, Montana, a town of 7,000 people, and relatively it's very large. It's the metropolis for over 100 miles in all directions. And it's a wonderful place to grow up because you are really free to do a lot of things that you couldn't do in larger cities or even very large towns, but also during that time, it was very easy to do interesting things. The schools were good, there were plenty of activities, and it was easy to be involved in all of them, so you could have a lot of friends, develop a little bit of skill with personal relationships, and you had some control over your life. You could make decisions, and kind of a unique thing about a small town like that at that time, uh, you can work. I was a pin setter in the bowling alley from third to sixth grade, never missed a night in the season, and uh, sold papers for years, and also, you know, shine shoes, anything you could do, and uh, got my social security card at eight years old and have the record to indicate what I paid. Yeah. Well, you also collected coins, didn't you? Yeah, I am a coin collector. The great thing about being a newspaper boy is you get many, many coins. And uh, s some of them were interesting and valuable, and you could pick them up easily. And in small towns like that where there's a lot of rural people in the area, many of them save some of their coins in a jar. They'd throw them in, and they'd be 30 years old. So they were out of circulation for all that time and then eventually bring them into a bank, and there were very good ones there. The other thing that a few states had, we had silver dollars, and that was the currency. No one used paper money, and so I do have a nice silver dollar collection. And from Montana, you moved into the LA area. Can you tell us how the move occurred and why you moved there and what happened when you arrived? Sure. Uh, my mother raised me, I think she, she had a terrific mother, all defects are mine. And uh, she always wanted to, to leave and go somewhere else. And I was interested in staying because I enjoyed that town. And my junior year of high school, I figured out I probably ought to go to college somewhere, although I had no idea particularly what that was and didn't know people who had gone. And I s said to her, uh, OK, I'm willing to to go somewhere, and about that same time she was offered a job in Los Angeles at a newspaper as a bookkeeper by the gentleman who owned the newspaper in my home t hometown also. So my junior year, she left just after Christmas and moved to Los Angeles, and I actually lived alone for the rest of that year, although the whole town's kind of taking care of you. Finished my junior year, and then I moved after that for my one senior year in high school in. Uh, southern part of Los Angeles in the L.A. Harbor, Wilmington area. Mm -hmm. Did you discover even at that time that you were skilled or better at mathematics or other topics uh, in school already, or was this coming later? When you're in a smaller school, there were 400 in high school in Montana. I mean, you do know roughly where you stand, and I did know academically I did better than most, but our system was we had eight periods and we went to school till 345 so everybody had a study hall and I never took a book home in Montana ever because I was working and enjoyed that more 
And, uh, but in study hall, you could do the work that was relevant to other things. So I did know that I was reasonably decent in most subjects. And uh, the one thing that happened that I didn't th think it was so great, I mean, I was delighted, but the school gave a test of what math you would go to your first year in high school. And they'd been giving it for years to the eighth graders. And uh, somebody this year I was there said, that's the highest grade we've ever had here. So well, that's wonderful. That was an indicator, and that was nice. And uh, then in Los Angeles, there was kind of a citywide mathematics fair or competition of some sort. I don't think it was overly organized, and big tests you had to do when you were there. And it, I was fortunate. I, got, I remember I got second, but I won a slide rule which some of the people may know what a slide rule is. It was a piece of equipment to allow you to do a lot of calculations more easily than by hand, but it was mechanical and way before the electronic things that can do it now. Um, and then from the, the uh, senior year in Harbor City, Wilmington area, you went to UCLA. Uh, did you look at other universities? I mean, how did you come up with UCLA? I, I didn't. I think there was the SAT that they had everybody take or at the school I was in, or many people. And I did reasonably well on that, particularly the math part. So the guidance counselors came and found me. And they were kind of enthused, because at least I did decently on that. And uh, they said, uh, where are you going to school? As if I should know, and I should go to school, to college. And so I thought, well, Montana State, probably. They said, Montana State, they knew nothing about Montana State. Have you ever heard of UCLA? And I said, I know they play football. Had been to games because they had free tickets for all types of athletic events that were given to newspapers then. Nothing sold out. And uh, I got to use a lot of them. So I knew what UCLA was, and they said, you should go to UCLA. So it's the only place I applied, and that's where I ended up. Wonderful. Great place to go to and, school. And what, what major at UCLA, and why, uh, how did you choose that? Well, I thought about both math and engineering. And the first, I was admitted as math, but you can change it. And I looked at the requirements then after I did that. And engineering had sequences that were a solid uh, four years, the semester plan. And so a sequence of eight courses in a row was one part. So if switching from math, engineering would have been much more difficult and you'd lose time, where math uh, did not have such a restrictive curriculum and they didn't have as many courses. Engineering had more than others. So I switched to engineering and at that time their degree was in simply engineering, generalized engineering, because the dean who started the school came during World War II and when the school started and over half of the people in engineering with degrees apparently practiced in a field other than they were trained in. So he thought the basic uh, ideas of engineering would be better to teach, and so we got a lot of generalized engineering, and I specialized a little in electrical because there was a little bit more math there, and I thought that would be potentially relevant for me to know. Was that also the time when you became interested in operations research, or did you hear the word operations research at that time? It, it was. It, uh, my sophomore year at UCLA, during Christmas time, my cousin, who was 12 years older, who I knew reasonably well, but he had left Lewistown by the time I was six, so I never had any advice from him on anything to particularly do. But he had went to the Korean War, came back, and went to Montana State, and uh, got a degree in math and in a master's, and he worked at Boeing then. So he came down for Christmas, and I asked him, uh, what do you think I should kind of focus on in engineering, given it's generalized? And he said, well, at uh, Boeing, people in operations research are naming their salary and their hours. And I thought, gee, that's consistent with what I hope to get out of life. What is operations research? And uh, he kind of outlined it a little bit for me. And then I looked at UCLA engineering actually had some courses in that that were typically evening courses for professionals and grad students, but any undergrad could take them and they didn't require things that couldn't do. So I did take a few courses then and enjoyed them and 
I remember the first course, though, you walk in, and here's all these guys who work for big companies. They're in their suits. They look like they know what they're doing, and you walk in and think, I have no idea. And in fact, you know, it worked out. Uh, sure. they, didn't, they were in the course because they didn't know some things, too. Absolutely. Which is nice. Uh, from UCLA, um, you went to MIT after you graduated from UCLA. Tell me a little bit about your involvement with the faculty there, and I think you worked at the OR Center as well. I, I did. I might briefly mention how I got there is I thought a good time to interview companies would, and a lot of them, would be at the last semester of my senior year. So I did that, and uh, I thought I'd probably just go somewhere and work. And one place I interviewed was Bell Telephone Laboratories. And I chose to interview them during the Easter break week and got a friend of mine to uh, do the same thing because I learned, I went to the Bell Labs interview. It was the worst interview I ever had. He said, first words, what's your grade point average? And I had a good one, I think 3.7 something. And I said that and he said, would you like to come back and visit Bell Labs for a couple of days? That was the interview. So I said, sure. And you could add things on easily on trips like that for not much money. So it was spring break, got a friend to go who I knew had good grades because I knew they'd offer him then. And we went to uh, Fort Lauderdale, the only kids from the West Coast there for a couple of days, and then to Puerto Rico. Then we went to interview Bell Labs, and that's where I accepted the job. And, and they had a very interesting program then, it being they were for essentially a government agency, even though AT&T wasn't, and they were the research group and a tremendous organization. And uh, they would take about 200 people, and they supported them to get a master's anywhere, half of them full-time, half part-time around the area. And so I was offered where I'd like to go if I could get in, and uh, so I applied to MIT. I found out they had a good R OR center, and Fortunately, I was so, so were some of the people, who were some of the people in the OR Center that uh, you worked with and you were impressed by and enjoyed working with? Well, over the three years I was in grad school, then I thought I was only going for one year, but it was easy to meet people. The OR Center was, is the oldest in the country and founded by Philip Morse, who was uh, kind of the father of operations research in the U.S. A lot had started in Britain before then and then also here slightly behind and it worked on important problems during World War II. So he was the head of it and I was there the, the I guess the 14th year after it started in 1966. And uh, th then Al Drake was the associate director who was always around the OR Center and I'd heard about him from other people at Bell Labs. And so when I went there I thought he would be the person I'd like to work with. And it was, the idea was I'd just get a master's and go back to Bell Labs. And uh, then uh, Gordon Kaufman, who was a statistical decision theorist, John Little, who everybody knows and has been president of this society and its earlier societies, the Institute of Management Sciences and Operations Research were there. And they really did have, a, obviously, a wonderful group of people, and then the colleagues I had there were wonderful, too. Yeah. And let's turn to Howard Rafa. He's uh, your mentor, your advisor, your co-author and uh, colleague. How did you meet him, and uh, how did that relationship evolve? Uh, I met him in the first year of grad school, but the way it happened is because Al Drake was around the OR Center all the time, uh, he was one of the people I asked, you know, what type of things are you interested in that one might write a master's thesis on? And he named three things, and one of them was decision making, no more specific. And I, that sounded interesting to me. I didn't, and I said, you know, what should I maybe read? And there wasn't too much at that time. It was, it was 1966. It was a mid 60s, right? 1966, the fall. So I did read a few things, and then I noticed uh, that Howard Rafa of Harvard was giving a seminar one evening at MIT. So I went to the seminar, enjoyed it a lot, and afterwards I went down and 
ask him a couple questions and I was kind of amazed he spent 10 minutes talking to me. And he told me that he has a course at Harvard that was starting in the spring term in a month and it was, I could, he'd like me to take it. So you could uh, register in the other school, mm -hmm. MIT students at Harvard and vice versa anytime the course wasn't crowded with local or with the school students. And so I did take that course and, and got to know him. And so my master's was kind of figured out the ideas there with Howard, but he said working on problems with two objectives would be an interesting thing to do, which is what the master's thesis was on. And Al Drake was my official advisor for that. And Howard also, I talked to him about thoughts and then wrote that master's at that time. And then a fortunate thing happened. Bell Labs decided they would have a PhD program and they had support. You were officially an employee. I had to turn in monthly sheets of what I did, weekly sheets. But uh, allowed me three more years of funding to graduate. So I decided I'd stay there and get a PhD because I liked uh, school, thought it was enjoyable and not a hassle and I enjoyed being in that area and everybody who came to that area from all over the world was kind of exciting. So uh, I thought about a topic and obviously you go from two objectives to more than two and Howard was interested in that and so I asked him if he would be my advisor which is kind of a big task because he gets no credit for me. He was at Harvard and MIT had a a rule, two rules to get a PhD. It's incredibly flexible on this. And uh, you need to be there one year and you needed to have a MIT professor as your advisor. And uh, yet I felt MIT always had the thing, if there was a good reason to break any rule, you need to go through the effort to put the case forward, but you could do it. And so I thought about, I would like Howard as my advisor and I got him to agree partly because I said, I won't be here every week for you to talk to me for an hour and tell me what to do. I mean, I do know you've got more important things to do and um, I'll work and talk to you sometimes. And he's such a gracious man and, and smart anyway, you'd get as much out of him in 10 minutes as many people in much more time. So he agreed and then I thought, now how do I convince some of the MIT people and F Phil Morse, was on my doctoral committee and I learned that Phil and Howard had never met each other and yet they're both very famous in their separate places and I said well one benefit if you both agree to this is you get to meet the other person and then Al Drake was the third person and it worked out fine and, and obviously the MI, I think Al did most of the work of the processing of what you need to do to satisfy right. MIT and then and all three of them gave me advice. So, I mean, th that period of time between 65, 66, 68 was this breakthrough area of multi attribute utility theory as we know it now, right? I mean, you started with two objectives, you said, for your masters already? Yeah. And then N objectives with multiplicative and additive utility function and the whole, the whole package, right? The rest is history, so to speak. Well, yeah, one, one big structure of multiple ob objectives was the dissertation. Right. It had one thing that I believe a lot for OR is it had theory, practice, and application was after the colon in mm -hmm. the title. And so it had some of each. And I, I should say that, I mean, Peter, Peter Fishburn had laid down prior to that time the foundation for uh, additive utility functions. And, uh, yeah, I think it was published in 65 and certainly talked to Peter after my dissertation and, and we wrote a couple papers together too. So he certainly had a lot to do and many others have contributed to the field as you know, including yourself. And uh, so that's, I think, that when it really got things started. Mm -hmm. So you, you got your PhD and uh, what was your first academic job? The First job uh, was as an assistant professor in civil engineering at MIT, but it, 
came about because I finished one year earlier than they needed. I mean, they gave me three years, took two, and, but Bell Labs had paid me and I was an employee. And so I thought I would go back there. And Bell Labs hired a lot of operations researchers. And so I went back there and said, I'd like to re-interview for where I would be at Bell Labs because I was in engineering electrical switching systems. And that wasn't who I was after OR. And not being in this, and I talked to the key guy there who has that, and he said, if you come back to Bell Labs, you're going to be in engineering switching systems. And that's it. And I said, well, then I guess I won't be coming back. And, and it was that short of a, of a time. And then, uh, so as the first graduate in their doctoral program that was internally, some people wanted it and didn't, and then I didn't come back, which was unfortunate. But I certainly was considering it. So I interviewed three different universities and chose the MIT offer a lot because Howard was in the area. And by then, we had decided to uh, write the book Decisions with Multiple Objectives, which we'll wasn't come, the title we'll, at that We'll come time. to that in a minute, yes. Uh, so, but after starting at MIT, you did some other things and then you ended up for a while at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. Did, did you actually take a leave for that or did you resign from MIT to go to YASA? Uh, I, I did resign. There is a, a step in between. I was at MIT three years in civil engineering. And when I was interviewing, even for that job, I learned that Boston University had a program in Europe uh, that was a master's program, and in Germany in particular. And I thought I'd always like to go there and live there for a while. And I kept saying, whenever you have an opening that you need a foreigner, meaning a non-Boston University person, call me up. And I kept contacting them every six months saying, still available, don't forget about me. And they called and what would have been my fourth year at MIT, they had that. So I actually resigned from civil engineering to go one year to uh, Europe. But kind of in conjunction with that, Sloan School, the business school, hired me at MIT. So I had leave my first year from Sloan. And uh, I thought that that would have been maybe a little better place for me anyway. So I came back for one year at Sloan. And then during that time, the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis had come into existence. And so Howard Rafo was the director and had been negotiating there forever. And he, uh, it was just a great opportunity to go there. And I thought, not very nice to ask for another leave of absence. And then I thought, I really prefer living in long term in the western part of the United States. So even though it's a tremendous well, place to be. You went by tour through Europe to go to the west. Right? Yeah, <laughs> That's I, I, quite I an unusual, unusual career. Um, so let's, let's go to the book, uh, the book. I mean, this is now a classic called Decisions with Multiple Objectives that you wrote with Howard Rafa. And uh, tell us a little bit about how this all happened, how you started it, uh, where you wrote it, and how the interaction worked. So it's a one big package. Well, I remember uh, I thought about what would be a wonderful thing to do, get, given I was finishing up my dissertation. And by, at the very end of that second year, uh, remain at MIT. And I thought, boy, to write a book on this with Howard would be terrific. He's the best in the world. It would obviously be wonderful for me, but it wasn't so obvious why it would be a great deal for him to work with some grad student or just finished. And so I thought about his objectives very carefully and, and uh, tried to construct it so it would work out on the ones that he might be concerned about. And the main ones would be uh, the dependence of his time on it and maybe the resulting quality of the book. And I said, you know, we can meet anywhere at any time. Things can be postponed anytime you want because he had a lot of important things to do. And uh, if at any time you don't think it measures up to what you think is appropriate, it's just over. And the other thing I said, I know you would like this book to exist. And 
you're not going to get it done alone. And I said, I won't have anything more important to do. And so he didn't feel constrained. And in fact, that flexibility to not feel we had to push turned out to be crucial because the negotiation, as you, you well know, for the International Institute for uh, Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna went on for a while. And for those who maybe don't know, it was a child of detente. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, the East and West leaders there, and in fact, uh, uh, Premier Kosygin from the Soviet Union and the prior to being President Johnson of the U.S. were both realized that crisis was close. Is there any way, anything we can cooperate on and kind of start something? In science, it came out, and through a lot of negotiations, it was the Institute in Vienna. So Howard was very busy during that time, the creating and the negotiating, and then he was the director for three years. So that's what IASA was. So I was delighted to go there, and then whenever he did have a little time, we could make some progress on the book, and we did. And so in 1975, given we started in 69, we were done. And in 70? Uh, uh, 75, so from 69 to 75. Okay, well we that's consistent with my memory because I know that you gave me a pre-copy to read and I knew that it was a, a fantastic book even then. So did you know, did you know that uh, were you surprised a little bit by the impact it made or the, that it now is an absolute classic in the field? Uh, in, in some sense, I'm, yes. I think though we didn't ever discuss, Howard and I, and I don't, didn't particularly think about it, what will happen to it. Certainly we had the aspirations that would have a, make a positive contribution to the field. And uh, I remember when I would, used to think of problems, I thought, first year I thought, what's a multiple objective problem I could think of? And everything seems single objectives, like there's a waiting line, what do you want it to be shorter? And then once you get into it, you can't think of a problem that doesn't have multiple objectives. I mean, you got a waiting line, well, You'd like it to be less time to wait, but you'd like it to be very equitable for who waits because the less time's on the average and, and those types of things. And you'd like the people in the line not to be upset. I mean, and those are different. They're correlated, perhaps, in how well they're met. So we were, well, I think we're both surprised that it it's still sells today. It's 50 years after that time. Yeah, well, certainly it deserves it. Um, then you made another move, which surprised some of us who were friends and observed you, that uh, after YASA you joined a consulting firm, a Woodward Clyde Consultants, which generally, if you're academically minded, could be a dead end. It's hard to get back from consulting to academia. So why did you do that, and how were you able during your Woodward Clyde consulting days to keep such a high academic profile. I think that would be a good lesson for our listeners, especially the younger ones. Uh, well, the way I heard about Woodward Clyde, uh, Al Drake and I taught a summer program on decision analysis that included multiple objectives. In the beginning, it was a two-week program, and it went till about 1980, two something, a lot of years. and in. So I came back from IASA to teach that because it's only two weeks. And uh, one of the guys I met there was an executive vice president of Woodward Clyde Consultants, an engineering and geotechnical consulting firm. And uh, so he offered me a job out of the blue. I was going to come back and, and enjoy myself for a while and then look for a job. And it seemed appealing. And I took it, and I was head of what they call the decision and risk group to construct it. There are about 700 people working, and they worked on like where to site power plants and risks of LNG facilities, and uh, had the best earthquake group in the world. And they worked on real problems, and I'm interested in that, and had done some similar consulting, one with Howard on Mexico City Airport, uh, the development and partial siting considering different sites there at that time. So being one who believes in applications, I thought it'd be nice to go and see how some of these multiple objective utility functions might work and contribute. And so that was my motivation. And then we did get very good people there. 
And the other thing is uh, publish the papers. And a thing that everyone might find interesting is I asked John Little, uh, given I'm go there, what, what would be a good thing to do to keep the flexibility to go back to academia if I wished? He said, write one high quality paper per year. Yeah. Good advice. And the thing I did is, obviously, if you're a consultant in those days, you would turn in a report to the client. I would write the report so that it, because you have a lot of flexibility on exactly how it is written, such that it would almost fit very easily between two uh, separate parts of a published academic paper. The first part, given this general problem with these features, then what, and then a literature review, and then here's an example. That was the whole report that you could more or less plug in. And then you'd have a conclusion section of you know, what, what's learned here. And uh, certainly in those days, the operations research profession was very happy to have such things published. And also then from the consulting, you learn much more clearly what are some of the technical challenges that would be worthwhile working on that if you can get an analytical solution to some model, it will provide insight and help on other real world problems. So you improve the relevance of the uh, theory, theoretical work too. So I remember those days and, uh, and, and I remember that most of the early applications were kind of like tests or experiments, if you will, if, if this uh, the theory really would work in, in the, the real world. And uh, did you have, did, did you go in there and started to apply and you, you knew that it would work or, or were you also a little bit, well, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work? Uh, I think I was more that I thought it was work, but there was a lot of flexibility on what work meant. Yeah. Work isn't to, I didn't think of it as it gives them the answer, and you hand it over, and they say, this is wonderful, my problem's over. Work is really the insight they get to understand their problem much better. And I was quite sure you could help them on that. And uh, one of the things that amazed me, you know, when I f was a student, I thought you could go to anybody who had an important decision problem and say, uh, could you just tell me your objectives and tell me your alternatives, and then we can do a great analysis. And people can't tell you their objectives uh, we know th or a full range of alternatives, often missing very good ones, in a vast majority of the cases mm -hmm. where, where there's real substance to the problem. And uh, remember one time talking to the head of a large utility company about the objectives for siting a facility for a few bill million billion dollars in those days and talks on about the objectives and I said any other objectives etc cetera, etc cetera, and any and after a while I said do you have any environmental concerns oh yeah we got tons of environmental and it never came up yeah. and it's Ben Franklin said the same thing yeah. 200 and some years ago is many of these problems are so difficult because at a given time you are thinking of some of the objectives, he used different terms, some of the things that really matter, and the others are out of sight. And then at another time, they might even change around a little. And so the insight from kind of having it organized and helping them articulate their objectives and then alternatives that can achieve those certainly made contributions. So I wasn't worried about making a contribution. I see. And the insights, you can usually get to it. So let me just completely switch topics for a moment and turn personal. Uh, when and how did you meet your wife? And uh, tell us about it. Well, that was uh, making a decision. And uh, you have uh, choices. In those days, you could take flights. And if you were going from point A to B, and particularly I was going to Houston for a Monday morning meeting on, uh, on an LNG fa facility that was proposed for Texas and leaving San Francisco where I lived at that time and Woodward Clyde was, I left on Friday and went to Aspen to ski for two days. And while in Aspen, that's where I met my wife, Janet. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, that's, it really is. Uh, one thing that happened though, after we got to know each other, well, she lived in New York and was worked in an advertising agency. And I thought, well, 
decision making and marketing and advertising certainly overlap, we should be able to give a talk at an INFORMS, actually an Operations Research Society meeting then, which we did in New Orleans, and that way we both could go to New Orleans and have a nice time together. And, and the talk was on decisions about children's advertising on television. It was a big, big issue. You'd have politically, some people would say, it's horrendous. These little kids get up in the morning, they watch the cartoons, and they see all the sugared cereals advertised, and they eat it, and it's terrible for their teeth, and they demand it. And that is one side of the problem. But then you really look at it in a multiple dimensional sense, and we outlined the objectives that we thought were at least some that's relevant. There are probably 10 million kids who don't have a parent who gets up, little kids, to give them any food on Saturday morning or these other mornings. And one of the few things a three-year-old or four-year-old might be able to get for themselves is cereal. So the trade-off is a little bit, do you have any breakfast or do you avoid the sugar? And you but gave the presentation together or we like did. Yeah, tandem we did. or? We gave, well, tandem in a sense. Uh, the problem was much more in the marketing and advertising area. That's where everybody was yeah. complaining about these ads and things. And the outline of the whole problem was there. And then, uh, and then my part was, that's the problem. Here's a way to structure it and maybe speak more uh, or, or to understand much better what the implications of various alternatives are and perhaps create some that might be better uh, than any of the ones that have been thought of. So in 1984, which I believe was the year of the Olympics in Los Angeles, it was. you moved to uh, LA from San Francisco to join USC. And tell me a little bit about your USC time. Uh, well, the, a thing that stimulated the movement is our firm moved its offices from downtown San Francisco 25 miles out to Walnut Creek, which is a nice place. But I lived downtown San Francisco and walked to work. And, and a lot of people were disrupted by that, as, as you would in such a move. And so I was interested in doing something else and uh, learned of a program at USC that was one of interest. In fact, it's the one you were in, <laughs> as you know. They had a program where they had a master's degree in systems management, another one, system science, closely related, that was given all over the world to people in the US military, although people not in the military could take those courses too. And the teaching responsibility was uh, if you got research funds to cover half your time, two courses per year, which could be done in a two-month period. So because I was stayed living in San Francisco, because that's where Janet worked, uh, then head of marketing at Levi's and, and then at Sprint, it was, uh, that's where I wanted to stay. And so this was a way I could have a good affiliation and work with wonderful colleagues, you and some others. And... Uh, so it just seemed like a, a great pace to go spend some time. And we did get to work on a lot of interesting problems together there. And, and, and you could stay in San Francisco. Yeah. You met both of your objects. Yes. This was one of the few cases that I'd ever seen a consultant or somebody from a consulting company return to academia. So there is a way back, obviously. Um, moving forward quite a bit uh, in... The late 90s, you wrote a popular book, Smart Choices, with uh, John Hammond and Howard Rafer. What, what made you do that? I mean, it, it, uh, did, was it ripe for translating multi-attribute utility theory into something that could be done and understood by regular folks? I, I think a, a few things. Howard had, for years, wanted to have a popular book on that idea. Uh, and thought as many of us in whole our profession in operations research management science think uh, there's value to doing what we do and it's often hard having other people understand what it is we do and so he was always interested in doing that and john hammond had worked with howard prior to me and i knew him pretty well and wonderful guy to work with and so Howard kind of 
put it together and ask if we'd be happy to do that. And we thought it would be interesting. And that's how it came about. And so we worked on that for about a year and a half. Obviously, the communication is a lot different in a book for, for the general audience than it would be for a larger one. So, so you, you published it at Harvard University Press, or uh, Harvard Business School Press, and uh, that so that was in about 1998. Right, and uh, we were, we were fortunate, uh, perhaps, but it sold well. Their their standard was for a well-selling book, 50,000 copies, and sold that in a couple years, and perhaps some. Partly, a uh, couple articles on that book were in the Harvard Business Review, one of which been, has been reprinted in about six of the books that say Harvard's Business Reviews, must-reads, and things like that, which is nice. Uh, this was on pitfalls, right? Yeah. Pitfalls of decision. Decision Traps was the name of that t title. And then there's one on even swaps that's been reprinted a few times. and uh, but. We were a little surprised. It's now published in 20 languages sure. and a lot of different. <laughs> well, what's the most exotic language that it was published in? Uh, Kaz Kazakh or? Well, it's, it's, it's certainly in Arabic. Oh, really? And uh, it's in Slovenian, which is one of the yeah. smaller, smaller places. And it's, it's in all the languages that you'd think of would have a large one except French. It's even, uh, it, it, it's in Russian. There are three Chinese versions. There's the Hong Kong, the Taiwan. So let me ask a sort of a personal question again. Uh, do you use decision analysis or multi-attribute utility theory in your personal decisions, in your personal life? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely. And I think what appealed to me, this was the natural way that I thought. I mean, when I was very young, I knew what I would like in life. I wanted to be free. And that's why Lewistown was a great place to be. And I experienced what being free was. And so uh, then I wanted to articulate that, that a little more clearly once Janis Joplin had her song, Freedom's Just Another Word for Nothing Left to Lose. And so I thought about it. And being free is a means. If you're free and you don't use it, it's not worth anything. So I did think about what I wanted in life and laid out my objectives. And that's published in uh, Value Focused Thinking, a book that's with Harvard University Press. But uh, that always guides me on my important decisions. And if you really have your strategic objectives of life, answering, you know, why are you bothering to live in a sense, you don't have to be. Uh, tethered to those, but it's always that I'm trying to go in this direction. And so if you don't know what to think about and you've got a really messy problem and everything, said, well, what relates to what I care about? And I do think about those. The other thing that uh, where I really use it is with the concept of creating my own decision problems. But I don't call them problems. I mean, a lot of people, problems, they're called decision problems because they, something occurs so you have, and you think, oh no. And you got a decision problem to kind of make it better. If you get sick, you got a problem. You lose your job, a problem. And you try to make decisions to get you back to the level of quality of life or where you were before. And these are caused externally. You don't cause problems for yourself. Who wants problems? But the only way to purposefully influence anything in life is through your decisions. You can have a big influence by acting without thinking. But given that, I would like some really nice problems. And I call those that I create for myself decision opportunities. And I formally do this a lot. And uh, you're not trying to get back to where you were before a problem occurred. You're trying to make life better relative to how it was. It doesn't have to be selfish. It could be making it better for your university if you work there, better for your professional society by things you decide to do for it, hopefully make a contribution to better for society, the, the whole thing. And in fact, that's going back to how I dealt, talked to Howard writing our book, 
I thought of this book, Decisions with Multiple Objectives. So I know the alternative. I'd like to write a book with him. How can I create the alternative of doing it such that it's positive for him? It was the same, how do I have a job at USC, given I'm in San Francisco? I mean, you figure out, what can I contribute to make me really worth it at USC, and yet be able to have the one feature that's an odd one live in San Francisco? Now, they're close enough you could commute there, and a, a big aspect of that is, you know, as my best friend, you, gotta, you really know what's going on. You're not isolated. You don't walk away and not know. So in a sense, on all the big decisions, I'm always explicitly thinking. Most of the time, I don't do quantitative analysis or anything, but I do some things once in a while to get some, some numbers that might indicate how various alternatives like, might measure up on a couple of the objectives that I'm concerned about. And I can uh, qualitatively think, even think qua qualitatively about quantitative things about the other aspects of the problems. So I definitely use it and uh, I advocate it because, again, decisions are the only purposeful way to influence anything in life. So maybe you can uh, play this out also for your next decision. This, this was the decision to move from, to resign from USC and to take a position at Duke University. How, how did that play out? I mean, wh why did you leave USC? Why was Duke attractive? Well. They were a bit separate decisions, but I certainly used the same ideas. Uh, the program we were in that had uh, courses all over the world, so you'd go to places and teach for two months, uh, was terminated. And so you were kind of shuffled into different departments, and that just wasn't quite as good and was enough to stimulate thinking about what I, w what I like to do, which I do every once in a while, I think every five years, you ought to think, okay, I've got rest of my life left, what's some good things to think about? And I thought it would be interesting to be somewhere else, have very good colleagues in the decision sciences. Not that I didn't there, but I mean that would be a requirement uh, of the place I would like to go. And uh, I thought of various alternatives and then uh, looked at how could I contribute to those places and then thought Duke might work at Duke and a little bit longer commute, though, right? Longer commute, but the way it was set up, I still lived in San Francisco. I was not interested in tenure, and I didn't want to teach in the regular MBA program because I was a business school. And, that, and our son was then in, in high school and one that he fit in well in San Francisco, and I wanted to be around a bunch. So I would go a week a month, but when I was a Duke, I was really a Duke, you know, like nine, ten hours a day and do tons of things and communicate the rest of the time and work with many, many people there and you yeah. do all the setup during the one month and then you go away and, and you do what you said you do and they do what they say you do and you come back. And the other thing, of course, I said, you know, anything that was special on timing at Duke, uh, I'll be there if there's any way I can contribute. I mean, I can adjust the weeks and whatever. And that... So my job was to contribute to the 99 objectives that the business school has other than teaching the MBA program. And the simple thing is I thought if I can do a little more on that and not do something here, you know, the portfolio of one oddball is worth it. And uh, certainly my colleagues and the, and the administration there were really terrific about it. And uh, they, it was a five-year appointment and after the five-year appointment, I was reviewed, and I, th I think so for another five years. And a few, uh, one person said to me, "I want to thank you for making that the easiest reappointment decision we ever had." And it was—it's also much simpler because it's not forever and things. So, and it worked out very well. So uh, let's turn to the present. You're now uh, emeritus professor at two universities, Duke and USC, which is probably pretty unusual, but great. And you're not inactive. You're writing a new book. Uh, tell us about that. Uh, that's a book on what I'd say is the neglected front end of decision making that I alluded to earlier. Uh, Many times people rush in and they got a decision problem and there's a big push, I want to solve this and get it over with. Or 
procrastinate and not deal with it. And before the solving anything, it's really important to understand the decision. And the front end is, uh, what's a statement of the problem I'm dealing with? And often a, a poor statement is, for instance, shall I do this or not? And the problem is not is everything else in the world just about. Because if it's a three-week thing, shall I do it or not, it would depend on what you would do with that three weeks if you don't. So anyway, just stating it, but then you really do the work. What are the objectives you hope to achieve by doing it? And then use the objectives partly to stimulate good alternatives, because anything that can contribute to one of the objectives is a part of a good alternative. And then with that set of objectives and alternatives, you've got a great frame of your decision that indicates every piece of information you would like. That's when you want to gather information once you understand your decision. You don't want to go, quote, as I've heard sometimes, first thing I'll do on this big decision is gather all the information. Millions of dollars might be spent, and a lot of it's not useful, and it takes a lot of time. And that's because it's not only relevant to the choice. So that's what the, the book's about, the front end, and it's for well, anybody who makes decisions, but it includes businesses and organizations because the mind is the decision-making aspect. And one can say business decisions and personal are different. But the thought process occurs in mind, so it's got to be the same. What are the objectives? What are the alternatives? People have them in the same places. And then certainly for some organizational business decisions, you'd like real analysis afterwards, decision analysis and things. And you can't get practice on problems without really having a fundamental understanding of what's relevant to the problem. So people in one aspect of a business wouldn't have any idea what the objectives might be in another one. If you're in pumping out the oil in a company and you've got big decisions, multi-billion dollar decisions, you wouldn't know what the objectives would be in some big refinery decision. It's just total, totally different. And so it's hard to have problems where everybody, let's say in a class, can create objectives. Say, here's a decision, figure out the objectives. So what we do, we say, given a decision of the following type with these objectives and these alternatives, then. That's kind of the first of how we teach much of this. And you've thrown away a lot of the stuff that's crucial, that front end. So that's what this book is about. Good. So you obviously had great success in academia. Great applications made a difference to organizations, decision makers, and so on. Did any of your work get caught by the public media or had an influence sort of on the general public in any way? Uh, I don't know an influence, but, but some of them uh, got picked up that I was interested in. I mean, one idea... People don't like to make trade-offs of statistical loss of life versus money. And as you know, we have government programs where some spend $10 billion to avoid one person losing their life. And there's other places that government agencies spend 200000 and we can save a life. And there's now, it's much better than it used to be, a lot of work, and you can certainly save a life on the highway by investing $5 million, $6 million sensibly to make the highway better in a certain location. And there's data that will support these types of things. So there are now even some recommendations by some agencies like Department of Transportation where I think they use $8, $9 million as the value of statistical life. So. One of the other things that would support the idea for the people who say you can't put a dollar value on life is when you get that money from the government is basically our money. It's everybody in the country's money. And you take money away from people, you make them poorer. And Aaron Bildovsky had done work that richer is safer. And I was able to quantify that because more data was available. And for how much money that we take out in taxes, so to speak, and transfer over here to save a life, how many people died? And it amazed me at the time. In today's money, uh, five or six million dollars, somebody would die. You don't know who they are. So that was published, and that was in, uh, I, I think, Business Week at the time. And 
was a little bit of a different idea. And another one is I looked at why people die in the U.S. much later. And uh, two million deaths, a little over two million per year in the U.S., over half of them could have been avoided if the individual who died would have chosen readily available alternatives to them. So the biggest cause of death was overwhelmingly personal decisions. And the big ones, which I knew you'd get the data, was kind of trivial, being way overweight or smoking lead to almost all diseases. So that would have a big impact, but those occur later. I was amazed, even the age group from 14, or 15 to 24 by 10 year groups, every group it was 55 to 60% could be avoided from age 15 to 64. Yeah, that for the younger ones, that was it, and drugs and things. Yeah. And not saying it's trivial, but there are decisions there. And I mean, that certainly surprised a bunch of people and surprised me at that lower end. And uh, that was in, in Wired. And some places pick up those ideas. But in each of those cases, I partly wrote the article hoping that's where the impact would be. Not that these are answers, but have people at least think about it. Last question. Uh, so what do you think, in summary of your academic and applied life, has been your major accomplishments, and how would you like the OR community to remember you? I think, I mean, the, the major substantial contribution was probably to uh, earlier the multiple of attribute utility theory, as you said, and the more quantitative. And then much later is the, the general structuring and understanding of the decisions we face and how crucial that is to really guiding our life. And I would like to be remembered, one who made some of those contributions, and I'd like that they think both to the theory part of the question, but also the practice, meaning how you implement it, can implement it and implement it well, and then third, how you can apply it so that you do have some influence. I'd like our profession to do that. And partly why that's my answer is my f strategic objectives of my life, which I've laid out, one is to uh, really enjoy the thinking part of life, and that's thinking, learning, understanding, wisdom, using it, and then the enjoyment part of life. And that's uh, fun, excitement, etc. And that's what I get out of life. And what I'd like to contribute is to the quality of life of family and friends. Those are two separate branches of that. And then make a quality of life more generally to others, including my country, which, you know, gave me a existed because of a lot of people's work before me to have, a, in a sense, an incredibly large set of opportunities and a fairly decent life that you could follow and probably have that come out. And if you put some effort in and if you decide what you want to do, very likely you can do a lot of those things is what seems to be the case. All right. Well, on that note, thank you very much, Ralph Keeney. And, uh We'll see you soon.